All right, great to have everyone. Father's Day weekend. Let's give it up for all the fathers. Man, dads, you're looking sharp. Some of you got your sandals on, just rocking the dad bod. We love that. We love that. Well, I want to mention a city for you, Platteville, Platteville, Platteville. Let's say it together. One, two, three, Platteville. Not too many people go, when I grow up, I want to go to Platteville, Platteville, Wisconsin. Maybe you don't know this, but they actually have the world's largest letter M there. Check this out. On a, on a hill, it's massive. It's almost the size of a football field. Not really a big deal. It was a letter that was put there for a school, a mining school, and so they just kept it up there. I think Morton should try to beat this somewhere. So if we can get a couple farmers to build a giant mound, we could, we could overcome this. We could take out Platteville, Wisconsin. Maybe not. Maybe not. But the other thing Platteville, Wisconsin is known for back in the day, in the 80s, 1987 to be exact, is every kid's dream to go to Chicago Bears training camp. And there's my brother and I. And my dad took us. is 155 degrees. That's how hot it was in Platteville. Man, it was incredible. We loved going there. And I have a lot of little bro moments, if you will. This right here is Otis Wilson. Remember that guy? And see, what happened was we were trying to hunt them down, get their autographs, get their wristbands. And I think, you know, we asked big around here at church. And I would ask big when I was little. I said, can I have your helmet? I asked him for his helmet. I mean, he's not going to give me his helmet. But I thought, why not? I don't have it now. Might as well ask for it. So I asked for it. And he put it on my head. And then when I tried to take it off, I couldn't get it off. And so it almost ripped my head off. And that's how I got that. Platteville, Wisconsin being a little bro. I love showing pictures of my brother and I, one, to embarrass him and to just see what we look like back in the day. But we've been in a series about a little brother. The little brother we've been talking about is James in the Bible. James was the little brother of Jesus. At first, he didn't believe in Jesus. But then again, how many of us, if our brother came to us and said they were God, would we actually believe them? Probably not. So we can identify with James. But James didn't believe God at first. And then he ended up becoming a pastor. Something happened in his life. Something changed. And he ended up leading the church. And so as we've been going through this series, today we're going to look at chapter 2. And I have to tell you, Father's Day weekend, we're going to the next level. You didn't come here to hear some wimpy, weak, watered-down talk. So fathers... I love you, but on the way to work today, this is work for me. I love coming to church. I heard the song, P.O.D. Remember that? Boom. Here comes the boom. Chapter 2, James throws down the boom. He throws it down and says, this is what it's about. Because all of us, fathers, moms, students, we all want a faith that's pleasing to God. How many of you want a faith that you know that honors God, that pleases God? That's why we're here. We want to honor God. But James... He's going to throw down the gauntlet, man. He's going to get up in our grill, and he's going to say, this is a type of faith that's pleasing to God. And think about faith for just a moment. What is faith? Like, how do we define that? Well, Hebrews 11.1 tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Another translation says it's, it's we have this confidence, Godfidence, that something will actually happen. We have faith that when we leave this life, we'll step into the next for those who have put their faith in Christ because of the work that he has done for us. But James, he's going to tell us, hey, what kind of faith pleases God? And all of us have faith. Even atheists have faith. They have faith that something else created all of this. Maybe not God, but just somehow something created it. We have faith when we go to the doctor. You go to a doctor, you don't really know. I mean, do you really know him? And then he says, oh, you're sick. I'm going to give you this medicine. And then you go, okay, doop de doop de doop But we go there, we get a prescription that the doctor told them to give us, and then we get it, we in faith think, okay, this is the right prescription, we take it. So a lot of times we have faith. Remember that first car you had? You had faith that would get you from point A to point B, and sometimes it didn't, and you had to pray in faith. Even if you weren't following God, you still had to pray in faith that it would get you where you needed to go. And so is our faith pleasing to God? Hebrews 11.6 says that when we, when we believe in him, when we come to God, we, we must believe that he exists, and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. The beginning of that verse says, it's impossible to please God without faith. And so James is going to tell us what kind of faith is pleasing to God. So let's check it out. James chapter 2. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Interesting. 
And then James actually, he gives the illustration. He says, if you see a brother or sister in need, they need clothes, they need food, and you just kind of bless them, hey, God be with you. He goes on to say, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. So James is saying, hey, that's fine if you believe it. That's fine. You can believe it intellectually, but if that faith doesn't have works that follow, it's a dead faith. It's not really a faith that saves someone. And that's kind of a tough question, because when you start talking about salvation, am I saved? Am I really right with God? Well, ultimately, if you've received that faith, there will be deeds. There will be fruit that follows from your life. See, saving faith is more than just a feeling. It's more than just words. It's, it's more than just a belief in something. It's a change that happens. When we give our lives to follow Jesus, we follow him. We don't just learn about him. We follow him. I'm, I'm afraid that many people will miss heaven by 18 inches from their head to their heart. It was in their head. They knew about Jesus. And Jesus says that in Matthew chapter 7. He says, one day, many, many people, many, many people will come and say, Lord, didn't we know you? Didn't we even do a couple things? And Jesus will say, I never knew you. See, our faith changes our lives. It changes our priorities. It changes how we treat people. And you were created to do good works. You were made in the image of God. You were made and created. Ephesians 2.10 says, you're a masterpiece. Wives, look at your husband. Just say, you're a masterpiece. Guys, just be confident and say, I know. I know. You're a masterpiece. We're You're God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So you were created to do good stuff. Where does a lot of good stuff happen? Through the local church, in your communities. God created us to do this. And so the cool thing, though, about James is James is not going to leave it there. And guys, I don't know about you, but I need an illustration. I need an example because I am, I, I'm just, a, I, need, I need to see it. I need to see it lived out. I mean, a message preached is great, but I need to see a message lived out. And that's what our world needs. They need a message lived out. And so James isn't going to stop there. He's not just going to go, hey, there's got to be works if it's the real deal. There's got to be, it's got to be seen. James goes on to say, hey, I'm going to give you an example. Don't you remember who's our guy? Right there, our ancestor, Abraham. Abraham, let's say Abraham all together. One, two, three, Abraham. I remember my parents sent me to church camp. We didn't even go to church, but I just went to this church camp. And I can remember sitting there, and they started to sing this song. Father Abraham, and any sons, any sons of God. You were at the camp too. Oh, I didn't know that. Why didn't you say something? I am one of them. And after about three hours, it was, Father Abraham, let's just. You know, that song, and it was in my head. I didn't know anything about Father Abraham. I just knew that Father Abraham was married to someone, and they like to have a lot of kids. That's all I knew about Abraham. But who's Abraham? Abraham. Abraham in the Bible was a guy when he was 75 years of age. God said, Abraham, leave your family. Go to a place you don't even know where you're going because if you do that, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless your family and I'm going to be with you and your descendants will be like the stars in the sky, the sand on the seashore. Abraham, you're the man. You're the guy that I'm calling to move. So Abraham was like, well... I guess God called me to do this. I'll go. And that's what part of the the Christian life is about. In faith, God asks us to do stuff. He asks us to leave our old life, leave the world, what the world has to offer for something much better. And most of the time, we don't even know kind of how to navigate through it. But God says, I'll bless you. I have something much greater for your life. And husbands, dads, if you'll listen to me, if you will go and become a full court follower of Jesus, if you'll say, I'm all in. I'm not playing church anymore. When I come to the house of God, I'm going to worship God. Maybe I don't even like to sing, but the Bible tells me, commands me to sing. If you will go all in and worship, worshiping God and loving God and loving his church and loving people, God will bless your household in ways that you cannot even imagine. And that's just not for dads, that's for everyone. So Abraham leaves and then about 25 years pass and he's like, okay, um, I thought I was going to be blessed. We're going to this new land. Um, I'm getting up there, God. I'm about 100 now. And if I don't have a child soon, I'm probably going to die. And how, are, how is this going to be turned into a great nation? Well, God is God. 
And one night, Abraham looked at Sarah. She was in her 90s, gave her the wink and said, well, we're going to have a child because God said so. I mean, how many of you would love to have children in your 90s? Not too many. In their 90s, Sarah has a child. They name him Isaac. He's going to be, through, he's going to be the one who creates this nation. It's just going to pass on. And God's going to bless him. going to turn him into a great nation. Well, then, when, a, when Isaac is a young man, not a young boy, scholars debate that, but he's a young man, God says, hey, Abraham, are you still with me? Are you still following me? And maybe that's a question for some today. Hey, are you still with me? Are you still willing to obey? Are you still willing to follow? We can't live on our past faith, that camp faith, that Father Abraham faith. We got to go day by day. Our faith is growing. Our faith is increasing. We're changing. You need to be a better follower of Christ today than you were yesterday. And we're all learning. And Abraham messed up. But Abraham, I mean, he messed up. There was moments where he didn't trust God, where he, he was like, I don't know God. So they have this child. Then God says, Abraham, take Isaac up onto this mountain, and I want you to sacrifice him. Whoa. What? Sacrifice your child? Well, in those cultures, they would make sacrifices. They would take animals. They would sacrifice them for God, forgiveness of sins, also as an offering to God. So Abraham takes him up there, ties him down. He's got the knife. Sometimes we just don't understand things in the Bible, and we have to just go, whoa, I, I would never do that. And if God ever tells you to sacrifice one of your children, it's probably not God. This is kind of like a one-time event here. You know, he's got the knife up. He's about to take him out. An angel shows up. Abraham, dropped the knife. He drops the knife. And it was in that moment, though, that Abraham was saying to God, God, you're first in my life. And God showed up. God provided Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider, God provides. He always provides. Some in here, you're so stressed about money. You're so stressed about the priorities of your life, where your kids are, where your kids aren't. You're so stressed. Hey, God is our provider. We have to put our faith and trust in him over our leadership abilities and parenting skills. Listen, I'm preaching to myself. Oh, what are they doing? I don't know about those kids in the neighborhood. Hey, I mean, you got to be wise. But I've got to trust God. God's looking out for them. God's protecting them. His hand's on them. Some of us just need to chillax. I mean, have a bomb pop, an ice cream or something. Go to the DQ. Go to Cracker Barrel. Go to Platteville, Wisconsin. Relax. God will take care of you. He'll provide for you. So what else do we learn about Father Abraham? It goes on to say, in verse 21, so Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see, his faith and his actions, help me out, church, work together. Work together. Turn to the person next to you and say, you got to work it. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened, just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. Only where in the Bible where someone is called the friend of God. Jesus calls his disciples, you're my friends, but the friend of God. What a title. And I want to be known as a friend of God. And it says, so you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. So this Father's Day weekend, as we look back at the example of someone who had faith, Abraham, his faith was in action. See, in that moment when he was going to sacrifice Isaac, he knew, he trusted God. He knew in that moment, if God wanted him to sacrifice his son, for some reason, God would bring him back to life. Because God said that he's the one who the promise is through. He's going to bless and, and his family and turn him into a great nation because of Isaac. He was the one. And so he trusted God. So what can we learn from this patriarch, this father of the faith? How can we have this type of faith? Well, two things we can do. The first one is, what did Abraham do? Abraham, he listened. What do we need to do? Listen to what God says. Listen to what God says. How do we know what God wants to say to us? Well, every day, he's got a word for you. His mercies are new every morning. And I can tell you this. The seasons of my life where I'm trusting in my own provision instead of God's provision. The seasons of my life where I'm distracted, what should we do? I don't know. Maybe I can leadership my way out of this, this, this lesson that God's teaching me. The seasons of my life 
where I'm insecure, where I'm not sure what to do, are the seasons where I read this really quickly and then just go on to the next thing. But the seasons where I'm in the Word and I'm reading it, and God's not looking for you to do this scholarly work and all of this. I think sometimes we come to the Bible and we're like, I don't understand it. Yes, you can understand it. It's at the seventh grade reading level. I mean, if you're not in seventh grade, then maybe, yes, I will give you the break. But this is the inspired word of God. It's not information. It's not some text. It's not some library book that you just get over. This is inspired by over 40 authors. The Holy Spirit of God has spoken to them. The word of God. And it's, it's alive and active. It's not some word that once was. It's a word that is, that's alive. And I think if truth were be told, would be told, I think the, the main reason why many people are biblically illiterate. And it's sad. That's where our generation is going. I think the main reason is because most people know when they open God's truth, it's going to reveal something about their life, sometimes about their heart, something that maybe they need to change. And they're afraid. But let me tell you, walking in faith like Abraham, opening this book, this book will change your life. I was saved. I didn't know what to do. We didn't go to church. One day, I got a Bible. Somebody gave me an old school New King James Bible. New King James. Mm Mm-hmm. I have it today. I have all these highlights in it. I didn't understand hardly anything, but I thought, well, people say, if you read this, it'll change you. So I was like, we're going to find out. In the beginning... What's the word? Well, actually, before that, it was, man, these are cool maps. Oh, these, this is the order of books. Wait a second. Okay, I get it now. And I began to read this. I believe God will speak to you more through his word, you and him, than I or any other pastor could ever speak to you. If you'll just give God 10 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day, just to start and ask God to speak to you. So what do I do? I've, whenever I get distracted in life, I have this leadership book by John Maxwell. I pull it out. I go through a leader in the Bible and just a leader a day. And I, I ask God to speak to me. And it's amazing. When, I, when I've been distant from God, and you know when you're distant from God, it's, it's like a relative or a friend. You haven't talked to them. I mean, you've talked to them. You've done some texts here and there, but you, you, haven't, you haven't really asked about their life. If, if you'll do that, God's not, you're not going to show up on day one and God's going to go, man, where have you been? You've just been wasting your life. You're such a loser. Loser. I mean, God's not going to say that to you. God's going to be there with you. And in his presence, he's going to be, man, I'm so thankful you showed up today. Man, I've been thinking about you. I've been watching you get stressed out over all of these things. Hey, just relax in my grace. I'm here for you. I can help you. But we need to listen to what God says. We need to listen to what God says. God's word is available to us. But the second thing we need to do is we need to do. We need to do what it says. We need to obey today. So you can listen to God's word, but if you don't obey it, there's no blessing in just hearing it. Just, I mean, you are blessed when you hear God's word, but I'm talking about God's favor, his blessing on your life. We love to call it in our house the fog the favor of God. I want some fog in my life. And when we obey today, there's a blessing that comes in our lives. See, I remember at Platteville, Wisconsin, there was this guy who drank the Kool-Aid. I mean, again, it was like 155 degrees. But while I was there, I watched this guy. He had all of this uh, Bears gear on. I mean, he had the helmet. He had the jersey. He had the pants. He had the cleats. And he would walk around with the football, and he'd be walking And he'd come up to some people just out of nowhere, and he'd go. And he'd do like a little running back move. And you're like, what? This this guy fell a long ways when he was a child. And you would watch him. He just, you know, while, while while the real players are passing and catching and receiving, you got this guy with thousands of fans around, you know, the football field. And he's just running around like, hoo, hoo, hoo. And you're like, whoa, I got to stay away from that guy. I mean, he wasn't a real player. He was a fake, phony player. Hey, are you a real player? Again, I told you, Father's Day weekend, boom. Are you a real player? A faithful player? Are you a fake player? That guy was a a fake player. 
What are areas of our lives where we can obey God today? Well, when you come to the house of God, the scriptures even tell us we're commanded to worship. If you're not worshiping God in here, there's no way possible you can worship him out there. Because I know what I'm against, up against, and I know what you're up against. You don't have to know the songs, but the Bible tells us what God loves. He loves it when we bow, when we sing, when we praise, when we lift up our hands, when we sing a new song. I mean, if you can't do it in here with your family, this is your faith family. And it's time for dads to go to the next level and lead the way in worship. God doesn't care what you sound like when you sing. He wants to hear you. He wants to know that you really believe in him. The devil's fine if you sing, I believe in God the Father. Because James said the demons, they believe in that stuff too. Good for you. And James started this whole passage out. He said, you say. Other translations, you claim you have faith. You can say you have faith, but if it doesn't work out in your walk, in your talk, in your action, it's not a saving faith. Again, we're not saved by what we do. We're saved by the one who has pursued us, Jesus, and his work on the cross. I'm thankful that I don't have to work for my salvation. How many of you are thankful for that? Because we, we, we'd be in trouble. We'd be in trouble. But when I've received that saving faith, it's going to change my life. And so how to have a God-honoring marriage, I'm going to think about that. I'm going to see what God's word says about it. How to worship him, I'm going to see what God's word says about it. How to love his church, we need to give our lives to what Jesus gave his life for. Jesus loves the church. Man, do you love Jesus? Do you want to build his church with all of your life? And again, building his church isn't just this building. It's, it's our family. It's our church family. Do you want to reach that lost person that you know that no one else can reach, but God has placed you there for this time, for this season? What are we doing? Other ways we obey God. We obey God when we bring back the tithe, when we honor him. It's so amazing to know that this church is built on so many people who give faithfully and sacrificially. We don't have one big donor that's just like, I'll just bank it all. No, we have a lot of faithful people who trust God and they return the tithe back to him. Man, is our faith in action? We've got to work it out. Jesus said in John 14, 15, he said, if you love me, you obey my commandments. Jesus is really coming at, hey, if you treasure me, if you love me, if you've received me, hey, it doesn't mean you're going to make mistakes. I make mistakes, many of them. If you'd like the list, talk to Danielle. She'll give it to you. and it'll make, it'll make you feel better about yourself. But if we love God, we will obey him. I, I, get, I get nervous in our culture today that we have a, a prayer-saving faith, that a prayer has saved us. I said a prayer one time. I went to church one time. James says, if that's the faith you got, that's not a saving faith. And has our world blinded us to say you can do whatever you want to do, say whatever you want to say, be about your life, and that faith save you? I would say that's not the faith that the Father has sent to save you. The, the faith that saves you is you receive Jesus. And by his grace and his mercy, you let him change you. you. You're just like Abraham. You say, that was my old life. I'm leaving that. And I can tell you this, if you're living for all the world has to offer, man, you're going to get to the end of your life. And it's going to be wasted. Because the life following Jesus, with Jesus Christ in the center of your life, your life will never be what it could be without him until he is that you're going to be searching, you're going to be seeking, you're going to be disappointed in your career, in people. But when Jesus is the center, man, things change. Has that change happened in your life, student? Mom, dad, grandparent, has that change happened? The faith thing. The other thing is that at Platteville, Wisconsin, the Bears had Hall of Fame players. Walter Payton, Richard Dent. These Hall of Fame players, Abraham, because he believed God and he acted in faith, he's in the, the Faith Hall of Fame found in Hebrews chapter 11. And on Father's Day weekend, we need some Hall of Fame fathers. We need some dads that will lead the way. I just did a funeral this weekend, and I thought to myself, what kind of faith am I leaving to my children? 
are they gonna, am I gonna leave them a faith that there will be times when they were with me and they watch me go invite someone to church, watch me go pray for someone, watch me give sacrificially, watch me help build God's church, not when everyone's around, but behind closed doors? What kind of faith are we passing on to our children? And do our children see us? And just like they said about Abraham, they would say about you, hey, my dad was a friend of God. He loved God. He gave his life for Jesus. Not just the church, but for Jesus. Could our kids, could our children say that, fathers? That's the greatest thing you can leave your children. Not your retirement, not a giant bank account, but to know that their father had the faith to step out and do what God asked them to do. What kind of faith do you have this weekend? Again, there's the fake players and then there's the real deal players. James says, do you have that saving faith? Faith and action that work together. Is your faith working together? Fathers, God loves you. He's called you, he's chosen you for this day and for this hour to lead your families, lead in your communities. God's not looking for perfection. He's not looking for you just to not do a bunch of bad stuff. He's looking for you to pursue him with everything that you have. And for some, maybe this weekend will just be just a recommitment. See, to believe means to commit to, to cling to. It means that there's action behind that belief. Remember James said, hey, even you say you believe in God, even the demons believe in that. My question is your faith in action. That's the question James gets up in our grill and asks us all today. Hey, would you bow with me in prayer? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth, God. This weekend, Father's Day weekend, God, as we honor fathers, God, we're thankful for them that you've, you, you've, you have a call on their lives. So Father, I just speak blessing and favor over every father here. Maybe some need to make a recommitment to the priorities, to listen to what God says and to obey today. Just like Abraham, we thank you for that example. Abraham stepped out in faith and he followed his God by his actions. Father, may our church be a church that is full of faith, full of dreams, things that God could do in our communities and our families in our state, even in our country, and around the world, like places like Haiti. God, may our faith be in action, and may we be the people that you've called us to do. Just say, Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on a cross for me. God, right now, I ask you to forgive my sins, and I accept your Son, Jesus Christ, as the Lord of my life. I believe that he died on a cross for me, and that he rose again, and that, God, he offers me this promise of eternal life, and life to the fullest. God, I want all that he has for me. And so today, I receive Jesus as the Lord and Savior of my life. Father, you see those who are responding to your grace today and receiving you and real, coming to the realization that they need a Savior. God, this is a great day for their lives. And so God, just today, as they receive your Son, God, as they boldly, publicly declare, Jesus, you're the Lord of their life. God, we welcome them into your family. And Lord, your word tells us that all of heaven is celebrating and cheering because someone who was lost has come home. Father, we love you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you that today people are finding you. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen. Hey, church, come on, let's celebrate. Hey, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, take a moment to subscribe so you never miss a message. Also, if you want to encourage someone, share this message with someone. And again, thank you to all those who give generously to support all that God's doing at Elevate Church. If you'd love to give, you can click on the link below and help share the message of Jesus. 